Okay, hey everybody, this is Dave Lorden and this is lecture number five in the six lecture course on teaching creative writing. And today's lecture follows on uh, directly from last week's lecture, which was the first uh, lecture uh, on uh, designing and teaching a, a 10 week course uh, or adapted to an eight or a six week course uh, to adults. So last week we covered, uh, last lecture we covered uh, the uh, generation period, which is the first two or three weeks uh, when it's all about settling uh, people into a comfortable creative atmosphere. Uh, and uh, getting them to generate material out of their own experiences, uh, dreams, passions, desires, uh, and so on and so forth. So that by the time you get to week four, when you start what I call the production period, uh, you know, getting them to be more independent creators, uh, shall we say, uh, in that period and to work on uh, refining some couple of pieces that they can be proud of when they're finished the course, okay? Uh, so that's where you should be at at, at at number three. They've created a good bit of material and they've got stuff to work on to move forward with it now you step in as the teacher and you start to kind of direct them a little bit more towards individual uh, projects and individual tailoring. Okay, so in this phase two, uh, this production phase, you do continue to set general exercises uh, because there will always be people in the class. You have to, like I said at the, in the last lecture, you have to cater for people. You have to do different types of homework and you have to correct different types of exercises because in reality, you have a huge mix uh, of legal levels, abilities and motivations in any adult class. So to, uh, to accommodate that, uh, you do continue to set general exercises that people can choose to do if they want okay but uh, you more importantly if you go right down to the bottom of the slide there more important you begin to set individual exercises and project based on the self-generated material okay so if you've got somebody who's really interested in uh, you know writing about uh, uh, music for example uh, and the experience of music that might be a team that has come out for them in the first three weeks then you you know you you you, you teach that you encourage them to write more about their memories of music their relationship to music maybe tell them to go at go to a gig and write a creative writing piece uh, based on the gig and so on and so forth so each individual is working with their own stuff then and you're tailoring them you're tailoring them and you're pushing them forward so they'll have a choice of being tailored and pushed forward or doing that general exercise okay so you do some new and revised uh, you go back over the writing points you've already done because of course over there you know they're not going to uh, lose all their habits uh, in 10 weeks so you try to improve them and you know improvement you do a little bit of revision around those clear writing points uh, uh, that I uh, that I instructed you about uh, in the first lecture Okay, you didn't go on to some new writing points as well, which I will talk about later. Uh, you want to start teaching a little bit of genre here. Uh, by genre, I mean, you know, short story, fiction, poem, that kind of thing. General genre, uh, I think at this stage, really. Uh, and uh, uh, But uh, I'm going to, at the end of the lecture, I'm giving you a full lesson that I did uh, on uh, flash fiction, which is a great genre to teach uh, I I beginner writers because, you see, short story is actually a lot of work uh, and, uh, you know, would take... <laughs> the whole of 10 weeks to get one short story right at least okay uh, but uh, you don't want to uh, you know uh, get people grounded down like that uh, so you do a small the small version of the short story you do flash fiction uh, and of course they can produce those uh, pretty quickly and feel a sense of achievement you know and we want to get that sense of achievement into them because then if they have a sense of achievement from reading the flash fiction they may have the courage then and the confidence to go on and try a much bigger job which is the short story which people you know and just just uh, uh, be careful about what John as you bring in so and make those genre lessons fun make them well researched uh, and good crack and really good prompts and it'll work fine and I'll give you an example of what I've done with flash fiction a whole 20 minute uh, uh, lesson I'm going to append at the end of the lecture for you okay again a big big thing to be doing here now is to continue to encourage and facilitate group learning so you have to kind of keep repeating the point uh, ad nauseum uh, when the feedback is occurring that you know you really want other people to join in with this and say whether you like it or you don't like it uh, what I tend to do now with beginner writers is say look okay everybody listen because at the end I'm going to be asking you what, which was your favourite and why okay and we'll have a vote for the best piece so <laughs> introduce a little bit of X factor into it there's no harm uh, you know to that extent uh, and that that tends to work actually uh, and they do listen more to each other and they do say why they liked it you know why they what they think could be improved maybe leave for another couple of weeks because people are just very uncomfortable giving what they see as negative uh, feedback but of course is constructive feedback honestly offered and uh, you know that's uh, it, you know, look it's just one thing that adults get it get don't don't really get for for quite a while okay uh, and uh, so you know we're moving forward with students now that have uh, through the first phase uh, the first completion phase they've reached a level of generative confidence plenty of material and potential material that you're going to work them up from and an understanding of the basic disciplines and skills needed to produce a small piece of creative writing on a, on a weekly basis you've been through that with them uh, the three or the writing points i talked about in the last so here we are uh, your general pedagogic tasks and challenges uh, 
in the second phase uh, of uh, writing there are a few of those uh, that you need to be prepared for and be well able to react to okay convincing adults to risk being wrong well I've been through that uh, and uh, just try try and get them you know try and get them to share their pieces to accept feedback on them uh, to tell them that writing is a process of getting better all the time the more you do it the better you get and stuff like that uh, so it's important to put stuff out there and they'll they'll, they'll continually uh, introduce their pieces by this is rubbish that's terrible okay it's, uh, the amount of people who say that before they read things in a beginner's writing class so you've got to ban that uh, I ban that and say that's up to the rest of us uh, and even that little bit of banning uh, you know so they're not telling themselves they're useless uh, actually makes them feel better about it to begin with okay so you know it's a lot of psychology involved here and individual psychology uh, avoiding dropout through the creative tribe now the creative tribe I kind of you know is, is my poetic version of the Vygotsky zone of proximal develop or zone of reflective capacity isn't it uh, and what, what I mean basically is that the people are getting on with each other they're supportive of each other and that there's a warm atmosphere of creative solidarity in the room okay and you know this this needs a push from you as a teacher making sure they're seated and paired and all that sort of stuff uh, in the way that you know uh, facilitates uh, mutual uh, confidence and mutual trust and friendship you want them to make friends with each other and you want them to look forward to meeting each other okay so you know break times with teas and biscuits are very important okay you stay out of that let them go down the hall or if it's in the room where they're having their break time you get lost you're not involved in that conversation let them talk to each other uh, and of course they'll be talking about you and sometimes they might be that flattering but all the same it's better to have them talking to each other uh, you know and making friends so that's really important and they won't drop out then you know they won't drop out if they're if they're looking forward to seeing each other and it's about them their own their friendship and they're making new friends they won't drop out you know uh, dealing with hogging and disputations now there's a certain character that often turns up uh, in a creative writing class uh, he's a m middle aged man uh, and uh, he he's uh, he knows everything right uh, and he uh, wants to tell everybody all the different things he knows uh, and ten tends to take up an awful lot of the time and an awful lot of the space and you've really got to crush that straight away. Uh, and to be honest with you, uh, you know, the way to do that is, you know, look, say, you just have to say, okay, we'll listen, we'll hear the community teacher and say, well, I think it's, jo it's Joe's turn now, let her, let her say, say, say a bit about it and, uh, and we'll move on. Uh, or, you know, just say, look, we, we, we in, in, don't criticize the individual, you know, don't pick them out or anything, but, you know, make it, make it kind of a rule or make it something you say at the start of the feedback that we've all got about a minute each to feedback here now. So no long windedness, please, and stuff like that. So deal with it in that way. And if that annoys them, uh, you, you know, that's not your problem, really, okay? Uh, and if even if they drop out, to be honest with you, that's actually good, okay? You know, in this case, right, sometimes, because, you know, you can have somebody that really blocks a good atmosphere going in a class, and for the sake of the class, uh, it might be a good thing that somebody drops out, you know, and kind of send that off the record, uh, you know, but uh, yeah, I'm sure you, as if you're a teacher, uh, you, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, special effort to involve the shy and unwilling. This can be hard. This can be obvious. Sit down beside them and help them uh, write the damn thing. Uh, you know, read out their piece for them. People will often say, "Look, I don't want to. I don't want to read." And you'd say, "Well, will I read it? Because really, they want people to hear it, but they're just." making them maybe a little bit of a drama out of it, I don't know. Uh, so you read it for them and, uh, you know, just engage them, talk to them by name, ask them for their feedback, draw them out slowly, get them in there because, you know, there's a huge amount of gratitude from people like that if they have a positive learning experience and, and their shyness uh, and unwillingness probably is because they have had a terrible learning experience in the past uh, and that's what they're used to and you know they're, they're treading on uh, water here you know for for themselves it's a big step for them you know that shy unwilling person is making a huge effort uh, every week to come much more than the loquacious person uh, and so have sympathy for them and but at the same time you know <laughs> over time and subtly but insistently force them to par participate and thank you for it uh, i guarantee that okay uh one of the things uh, that you uh i'm going to list a few things now that you want to do uh, in the second part that is kind of general writing points or lessons uh that you set exercises from or are tailored exercises or general exercise so focus on uh, writing dialogue i'll go through a lesson plan for that in a while one of the things that uh, students 
always ask for in a beginner's class and uh, and not just the beginners all the way up to advanced every class i teach there'll be a couple of students and like oh look i don't know how to write dialogue can you do a class so it's going to be and everybody uh, appreciates it okay so it's a good one to do uh, getting to the point and starting in medias ray and medias ray is a, is a, a latin term i think for a, a, a technique invented by the greeks uh, which is uh, you know starting in the middle of the story the great epics uh, that uh, began western literature most people think uh, Iliad and, uh, and Odyssey begin right in the middle of the action. There's no prologue, there. but we find we get flashbacks later that fill in the background. Uh, and if you think about going to the cinema, uh, you, you you and the film, a war film, you, the war film invariably starts in the middle of a battle and then works its way back. Okay, so you suck the reader in basically with action. You know, action. Tr you know, fo you know, running forward, uh, 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 and then if there's anything to fill in, you fill it in later. You don't start with an introduction or a prologue. Okay, getting to the point. An awful lot of beginner writers have a problem getting to the point. There are many, many, many sentences before the one sentence that they actually want to say comes out. Uh, so a lot of time you'll be cutting, talking to people, getting to the point. You'll be talking to them about cutting out a lot of their writing and stuff like that. Like that. Experimenting with tenses, rewriting in the present, rewriting in the past, rewriting in the conditional, rewriting in the future, and seeing does it make it a better art object? It probably will, okay, especially if you change it to the present continuous tense, okay, and uh, like I say down there on the bottom of the slide, use the gerund, that's the ing, okay, uh, instead of ren, uh, he ren, he is running, okay, and just even the simple difference uh, between those two sentences in terms of how they engage the imagination is actually massive, okay, the human imagination is far more engaged by the present continuous tense uh, than by the past tense, yet beginners writers, and it's natural, you know, it's obvious why people kind of naturally or automatically write things in the past tense, because uh, we, we write out of memory, uh, and writing, of course, is, is uh, invented by human memory, uh, to, uh, and it's an extension of human memory, it's the original sort of cloud or hard drive, uh, if you like, so it's no accident that most people, beginners especially, will write in the past tense, but you've got to get them to write it in the present tense as if it's happening right in front of them, that will improve, you know, 90% of the time it will improve the writing, you know, uh, quite significantly and they'll see how obvious that improvement is and that'll be a good lesson to teach them. Uh, narrative perspective, yeah, uh, tell it from the point of view of another character, uh, tell it from the point of view of, uh, you know, uh, a woman, a man, a dog, a chicken, you know, a table, all kinds of exercises you can do to experimenting with narrative perspectives, third person, second person even, uh, if you want to uh, do one that people find really uh, challenging and a bit of fun too, you know. Uh, okay, so the importance of detail, uh, people will write very abstractly often uh, as beginner writers, uh, a lot of flowery language, uh, as I said before. So this time you want to bring in the importance of detail, you know, focusing closely on the on the event that you are describing. And beginner writers must always focus on describing events rather than, rather than feelings and all that kind of thing too much, okay? Writing is about something that happened and how it felt rather than how you feel just, okay? And that's a mistake that they make often. Uh, and if you're stuck in the writing about how you feel and you're talking in abstractions nobody's going to know what you're talking about uh, but so but if you describe the event that made you feel like that uh, you know then people are going to be able to identify a lot better both emotionally uh, uh, as well as sort of imaginatively okay so that's called rising from the abstract to the concrete uh, the immorality of writing and writing against oneself this is another kind of related one to the experimenting with narrative perspective uh, there's an idea in a lot of people's heads that we have to be good people especially when we write uh, uh, yet writing and morality are not connected writing is not a part of uh, you know of course it has you know there are moral writers and moral books and moral themes uh, and all of that kind of thing uh, but that's you know there are also immoral writers and immoral books and immoral themes uh, and they are just as much a part of literature and to be honest with you probably the greater part of literature uh, uh, than, the, the, than the moral books uh, so uh, one exercise and to get the idea out of beginners writers heads in or sorry into their heads that they can let their you know uh, evil bits go you know their <laughs> nasty bits go and they can write you know enthusiastically about murdering someone okay uh, because it, it, that will read better okay uh, and then uh, then you know uh, enthusiastically condemning someone for murdering someone nobody wants to read that we, we don't go to literature uh, to read uh, court reports uh, we go to it to be uh, you know uh, engaged uh, and uh, uh, you know surprised okay and
and uh, a way to be novel uh, is to be evil uh, in your literature. Now, there's no evil in the imagination. There are no consequences in the imagination. There are no sins in the imagination. Nobody gets hurt in the imagination and all of those kinds of things. You need to explain as well to people, I guess. So one exercise I do uh, is an exercise called writing against oneself, uh, where I ask people in the class, you know, who do they name, who do they think are the most evil kind of people in the world? Uh, and they will usually say uh, pedophiles, uh, mafia bosses, uh, serial killers, etc. Tyrants, you know, the answers are obvious, really. Uh, and then you get them to write a, 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 from the point of view of the most evil person in the world, according to them. So if it's a tyrant, they, they pretend to be a tyrant. Uh, and you, uh, you get them to write uh, about a terrible thing they did and how much they enjoyed it and how right they were to do it. OK. Uh, and, you know, that's they find that difficult, but it's a big lesson. It's a good lesson to tell people. OK. Now, novelty in and equals novelty out. This is a general point you make to people in the second part. Look, and you say to them, look, if you're watching Coronation Street, uh, if you're reading, you know, any newspaper, frankly, OK, especially any Irish newspaper, uh, you know, I don't really see much of a difference between the Daily Star and the Irish Times, uh, you know, uh, on, in most cases, to be honest. Uh, uh, and so I think the distinction between tabloid and broadsheet is over. So, yeah, so uh, if you're always reading the same type of book, if you're always watching television, if you're taking in cultural crap, OK, you will produce cultural crap. So people need to feed themselves, OK, good culture if they are to produce good and interesting culture. OK, so in, tell people to go to the uh, Irish Museum of Modern Art for a look at it. OK, tell people to go to the local exhibitions. Tell them to listen to uh, F Lyric FM instead of Radio 2. OK, tell them to read one of the classics. OK, they're all free online, by the way. Uh, I'll talk about that in a sec, actually. Uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, and so on and so forth. So get them to put novel stuff in, to make a commitment that once a week, at least, they will uh, listen to a type of music they never l l listened to before, go to an art exhibition, read a few pages of a classical book or whatever. OK, but definitely that they're getting a novelty. Now, mainstream emergence in literature, most people will be, uh, you know, familiar with just the very basic mainstream ways that people write. Uh, you could do an exercise, for example, on stream of consciousness, which people find enjoyable. I know you might think it doesn't sound like a beginner uh, 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 thing, but if you did the lesson properly, people enjoy it. It simply means stream of consciousness, for example, you know, writing uh, your thoughts down, okay, uh, in that order uh, and in, in the strange order that thoughts occur uh, and without the punctuation that we normally use, okay, and getting people to imagine uh, that they're, uh, you know, uh, gone uh, dumb, blind and, and deaf uh, and uh, etc. Okay, they've been in an accident uh, or there uh, or any kind of situation where people can't speak. Okay, what's going on inside their head and write it down. People enjoy that, okay? Uh, and then you could also talk about forms that, uh, you know, come from the bottom up, you know? Uh, spoken word uh, is one that is, you know, is, is say, marginal uh, in terms of uh, re literary respectability, but mainstream in terms of public culture. While the page poetry that's marginal, very marginal uh, to the point of, uh, you know, statistical non-existence, really, uh, in, in public culture uh, is mainstream within the academy and all of that sort of stuff, okay? So talk about how, you know, it's not, uh, the, 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 that literature is very broad. It includes spoken word and performance poetry as well as page poetry, uh, so that they should, you should be trying to broaden out their appreciation of what literature is, okay? And those different literary approaches that people take uh, in different forms, uh, you know, and so on and so forth, okay? So that'll be a good thing to be talking to them about. Uh, uh, if you cover all that, you'll be doing well, okay? And you will then be on to uh, phase three, which is the complete phase the completion phase okay uh, and that I would say would be eight nine or ten probably just nine or ten actually okay you might need that week eight to round off uh, with people what they're writing and stuff like that so you use the last two weeks uh, to get people to finish a piece they can be proud of, feel a sense of achievement. Okay, that's a major, major thing. You want them leaving the class feeling that they've achieved something, you know, and you have worked hard as a teacher uh, in profiling and tailoring, okay, uh, for them exclusively as individuals, as well as getting that creative tribe atmosphere going and know they're happy and know they're working on the thing they're going to be proud of, okay? Uh, you need to uh, work with them to organize possibly a formal uh, reading, uh, which outsiders are invited to be 
to read or actually other people in the night school. We had one in, in Bray in the night school. We didn't invite anybody except the other classes, uh, but it was still fabulous uh, and people really enjoyed it. And, and you know, the crack can be mighty at these things and families can go, God, I never knew you had it in you, all this sort of stuff. So it can be a great night for people, uh, but you need them to organize it. You know, you help them, obviously, but they have to be in charge of it, you know, otherwise it's not really teaching. Uh, even a little class magazine, as long as they do it themselves, don't take on the job in a class magazine. It's an awful job uh, and tear a waste of paper, you know, really. Uh, you're far better off do a live reading and record the live reading and put it up on YouTube and way more people will see that and it'll be there for a lot longer uh, than, uh, than, than a little class magazine but you know people might want the class magazine you talk to them about that uh, the exit advice then is what you also do to completion that's you know simply the advice you give people for where they're going to go with their creativity from here obviously going to be different for everyone should be tailored okay simple and honest okay nothing too complicated for beginner writers okay simple instructions okay uh, don't worry about being instructional with beginners writers they've come for instruction uh, when you go up uh, to the advanced level if you ever get to teaching advanced writers uh, 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 or specialist courses and things like that uh, with people who are very serious about being a writer or any kind of creator, uh, you know, then you, uh, <laughs> then, then, then you, you obviously, you know, you have to have a bit of to and fro in your advice and yeah, and stuff like that. And it's not as simple as just instructing people what to do, uh, but it is as simple as that. Uh, back in uh, back in beginners and honest, okay, so honest. So if you know, somebody still insists that they're going to be a thriller writer. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, or, or, or has dreams that are just beyond their capacity, subtly. Tell them about that if you want to, okay? Uh, I generally do, okay? But of course you have to be, uh, you know, discreet in those situations, okay? Now, uh, it, it, some advice you might give them. Uh, to do another class, uh, with you are another teacher. Now, I don't advise that you advise them to do another class with you because you're kind of failing as a teacher if you're not moving them on. Uh, and it's much better for them uh, if they move on to another teacher if they're doing another class and get another perspective. OK, because every creative writing teacher is different. And that's what's, uh, you know, wonderful about the field. Uh, so uh, you want people, you know, honestly, ethically, you want people to get a good taste of all that sort of stuff. So move them on. Join a writer's group. Suit some people, doesn't suit other people. Uh, if people are looking for a way to continue with kind of deadlines and assignments and they don't want to do another class you're advising them not to do another class in a writer's group they might have to form the writer's group themselves most writer's groups don't last even two weeks some last for years okay it just depends on the people who get into them uh, ask them about play, uh, tell them about places they might possibly send their work to an awful lot of beginners writers uh, might have stuff that's suitable for say Sunday Miscellany or, or, or a radio program more than for a literary magazine okay because mostly what you'll have from beginners is kind of anecdotal writing uh, or brief writing a brief you know six seven hundred up to a thousand words that often suits radio uh, and radio takes a lot of writing uh, local radio and stuff like that uh, so, uh, some then you know they wouldn't be at the stage of submitting to any serious literary magazines at beginners you know so uh, Ireland's own magazine for example is one I often advise because people have written an interesting uh, non-fiction history piece or something like that uh, or, or, or something that's kind of Irish uh, and that would suit them so have a think about that and do give people choices okay or, or some other creative activity you know tell them you know why don't you go now and do uh, learn a little bit about video because you seem very interested than that so maybe that'd be the next course to do okay uh, or you know you're talking about doing a children's book well you need to be an illustrator or, or hire an illustrator so if you're if you're half decent at drawing go and do an illustration or animation you know maybe your stories would be better as animation so maybe another creative uh, creative activity would be better for them okay uh, some books I would advise you to get to kind of firm up your own knowledge uh, uh, and to use uh, as uh, examples in class okay uh, with a lot of examples uh, Oxford Guide to Plain Language uh, or, or any university guide to plain language uh, is good because it'll help you with teaching those grammar points around clarity and you know might improve your own understanding of that uh, dictionary literary terms so you know what you're talking about exactly when you talk about you know uh, uh, villanelles or whatever it is you're going to talk about okay uh, and also students will ask you questions that they'll expect you to know okay so if they want to you uh, to if they ask you you know how many uh, syllables uh, is in four lines of iambic pentameter and you started looking at them i don't know you know so just uh, have a look through that princeton encyclopedia poetics you know this is kind of heavy uh, encyclopedia about poetry but it'll give you a real idea of how broad that form is and i've had loads of lesson plan uh, loads of lesson plans out of that one uh, loads
loads and loads and loads. You know, you could teach endless courses simply out of that book itself. Uh, for example, it's a good literature, Norton Anthologies, uh, Norton Anthologies of English Literature 1 and 2, but also they've, they've loads of anthologies, Norton Anthology of Poetry, Norton Anthology of Postmodern Fiction, etc. Maybe build up a collection of those uh, over the years. Uh, I, I'm not a big fan, as I've already said, of the kind of how-to book uh, uh, carry on uh, that's huge in the creative writing industry. Uh, the one I've read that I would, would respect is Stephen King's on writing, and it, it's you know it's aimed at the general reader. Stephen King has been writing for the general intelligent general reader for five decades, and it really comes across in this book because uh, he doesn't sound like he's talking to uh, you know an in, an in crowd or a load of professors or whatever. Okay, so and good good practical advice, and people usually like that. And uh, because I'm human and poetry anthology uh, or any of those uh, blood acts uh, anthologies published by Neil Astley, fantastic for poetry. You know the best poetry anthologies in the English language probably of all time okay uh, so you'll find endless good poems in these uh, for you to base lessons on or use examples my own uh, Young Irlanders anthology published by New Island uh, is 12 short stories from contemporary short story writers some of them who have become very famous even in the three years since this was published famous in the literary world I mean uh, and there's 12 really good stories there and if you want to talk to people about what Irish people young, young Irish writers are writing about uh, these days and the way they see the world and you want 12 different angles on that that's a real good one to get and use as a teaching resource uh, okay, uh, using less uh, researching lessons using online resources. Now you should be having you know maybe think about having a YouTube channel, uh, if not to put up your own video, at least to make playlists that you can direct your students to. Okay, so if you're covering flash fiction, like I said, uh, or performance poetry, you can make a playlist of flash fiction or a playlist of performance poetry, put it up on your YouTube channel, and direct your students there uh, to check it out. Okay, uh, now Gutenberg.org has got 99% of the best books ever written for free. Okay. Uh, check it out everything published before the year 1923 is up there Bartleby.com is also a classic literature but it's better organised uh, and it has things like the Harvard uh, Encyclopedia of World Literature the Harvard Anthology it's got a lot of Harvard stuff a lot of really brilliant early 20th century anthologies with lots of excellent examples of writing uh, Granted.com Grant is the short uh, you know the world leading short story uh, uh, magazine and uh, political writing as well non-fiction uh, is excellent you know, uh, and there's massive archives. Subscribe as well if you want, but there's already a lot of free stuff up there. Give you a good sense of contemporary literature. Grant uh, PoetryFoundation.com. Uh, that is a, 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 an heiress died a few years ago and left 100 million to a small poetry organization. And one, one of the things they've done is put up this brilliant website, which is Poetry Foundation, where, you know, endless poetry, but well organized uh, and thematically organized and tagged and all that sort of stuff. So if you're looking for a poem about, you know, Sad Halloween, if you put in Sad Halloween, you'll probably get 10 really good poems plus information about the poets plus information about the movements they were in all that sort of stuff so great for a great for lesson planning uh, poetryinternational.com is a, a more of a mixed bag really uh, but if you for example have somebody from New Zealand in your class you go to Poetry International and you go to the New Zealand page and you'll find 150 or 200 poems from contemporary New Zealand poets uh, and if you want to get an idea of world poetry poetry from Zimbabwe you know they don't cover a lot of uh, world poetry on poetryfoundation.org because they're concentrated on the canon uh, which is still quite exciting exclusionary really okay uh, but on poetryinternational.com you'll find the great sections on for example poetry in Zimbabwe is a great section well worth looking at stingingfly.com uh, I'm on the editorial board of that that's the main literary magazine in Ireland uh, and uh, they have an archive uh, which you should subscribe to uh, of the best of Irish writing for the last 20 years uh, far and away the best of Irish writing for the last 20 years uh, is found there uh, essays uh, poetry reviews short fiction interviews all of that sort of stuff so an incredible archive of contemporary uh, Irish culture uh, which I, uh, if you haven't explored, you should. Okay, uh, I've talked about the YouTube playlist. You should make themselves, and you can research lessons. This is always going to be a playlist if you want to teach about, uh, you know, if there's somebody Greek in your class and you want to do something from Greek drama for the crack for kind of welcoming them. Just look up Greek drama. You'll find a hundred playlists. Okay, uh, to learn about the history of literature yourself, uh, look at Yale lectures. Okay, the Yale lectures, English history lectures. There's a whole series. I don't know about eighty lectures on on English literature and and literature in general. Uh, and of course, you can get through them over a couple of years, and you build up your own general knowledge as a teacher. Uh, also, I use uh, films and dramas on YouTube uh, as teaching resources. I sometimes actually project in class, for example, spoken word films. Another thing you can do with multimedia, by the way, uh, which you should be thinking about doing. Okay, now the uh, I would use film, for example, in my lesson plan for what I do on dialogue. Uh, which is I do uh, the week before, the week, the lesson before. I'd say I do dialogue about week five. 
and at the end of week four uh, I would give students homework of watching a play by a master of dialogue on YouTube there's loads of them all Harold Pinter's plays all Beckett's plays plays by Carol Churchill uh, but with the one I give them is Henry Gibson's uh, Doll's House uh, there's an Anthony Cronin version uh, and there's several other versions but have a look at them yourself and see which one you think is the best and their writing task for homework is to write an off-stage dialogue between two characters from the play so they have to for their homework they're bringing in the dialogue uh, that's written about two characters in the play that they've watched the Ibsen's A Doll's House in my case uh, and, uh, and they have fun with that actually they find it difficult but they have fun okay uh, and then uh, I would uh, listen to their dialogues feedback a little bit on them think about them uh, and stuff and then I'd move on and I'd use the board uh, and I'd, call, I'd just say put up the board dialogue is a kind of sport right sport is a combination of play and combat Okay, the play element uh, is the eloquence and the beauty of the writing. Okay, the wit of the writing. Okay, and the back and forth of the writing. Okay, the uh, exchange that dialogue is. You know, it's two people talking to each other, two people bouncing off each other, two people in, you know, eloquent combat with each other. Okay, the combat, you know, in dialogue, in a play, not in reality, but in a play or a, or a, or a, or a, or a, or a novel uh, or a film, uh, there's always something in contention. Now it's hidden or open. Somebody's trying to seduce somebody else. Uh, somebody's trying to get a secret out of somebody else. Somebody's trying to, you know, uh, subtly manipulate manipulate somebody else uh, somebody's trying to you know there's, there's always contention uh, in, in dialogue open or hidden subtle or, or broken out and it's always connected to the plot okay so if you have that eloquence you know that eloquent combat that eloquent sport of dialogue okay like you know a strange game of tennis going back and forth and all the skill employed to beat your opponent uh, that you can uh, and if that contention uh, is connected to the plot uh, of the overall book then you are writing our play then you are writing a uh, good dialogue now you know that's a lot to take in for beginner students they're not going to become masters of dialogue a lot of writers never master dialogue uh, uh, and don't hardly write it at all other writers are almost all dialogue uh, take, take Bukowski for example when he's not monologue uh, he's dialogue uh, okay so uh, then I'd give a few examples and get them to write a fun dialogue for the last half hour of the class say or the you know so left leg versus right leg sun versus moon dog versus cat come come up with a few of your examples yourself uh, and put those on the board and give the students a choice to write the dialogue and that should get you a good dialogue class then uh, if you want to do it like that now watch my flash fiction Hi everybody, I'm Dave Lord and I'm a creative writing teacher, practicing writer and multimedia artist and I'm here today to talk to you about flash fiction, a uh, relatively new and on-trend fictional form which a lot of writers are getting into and a lot of readers are enjoying over the past decade or so and there's no sign of it going uh, away. It's going to grow as a form, I believe. Uh, it's also very handy for writers who don't write flash fiction or aren't interested in flash fiction but might suffer from a little bit of writer's block or might want something to take a break uh, from their usual writing practice. And flash fiction is very handy because there's not a lot of commitment involved in writing a flash fiction. Uh, it should be written with, you know, fairly quickly, not as quickly as it takes to read, of course, uh, but it can be written fairly quickly and can be a way also of uh, writers writing in, say, conventional forms or, or to try out a little bit of experimental writing or a little bit of genre uh, writing. So I do recommend it as part of any writer's practice. Uh, and indeed, anybody who enjoys creative activity Activity should get a lot out of writing flash fiction as well as uh, as reading it. I'm going to say, you know, briefly uh, what flash fiction is. In my opinion, you know, you'll find a lot of opinions about length and things like that. But uh, what there's general agreement on, I'm going to talk about first. Uh, then I'm going to talk about what the antecedents of flash fiction, where it comes from, you know, in literary history, what its ancestors are, and what its relations to those ancestors might do to inspire us in terms of writing flash fiction uh, today in our own practice. Uh, I'm then going to look at a, a concept called uh, Imi texting, which I used in my own flash fiction or short, short fiction book, First Book of Flags, Frags, First Book of Frags, uh, which simply means uh, parodying or pastiching uh, all kinds of non literary texts and making flash fiction out of them. Uh, I'm then going to go into a little bit about uh, the where what the do's and don'ts of flash fiction, what, what what one should should try to do and what one should try not to do when writing 
writing flash fiction. So I'll say a, a, a good bit about that. Uh, and then afterwards, I'm going to give quite a few prompts. And we should be finished with this tutorial uh, within about 20 minutes, I should hope. And hopefully people will get a little bit out of it. Uh, and I'll give a, little, a few pointers then to what to read uh, on, uh, online. I have a couple of, a couple of longer, more detailed uh, lecture notes online about the uh, flash fiction. So without further ado, uh, let's t start taking, I'll get out of your way and we'll start looking at the flash fiction up in the corner there you can see one flash of lightning from uh, sesame street and on the right there you see it, uh, an, an old chinese gentleman smoking a very big cigar well, what's the connection of those two things you might wonder and the third thing the flash of lightning in the middle well flash fiction is also called sudden fiction it happens suddenly a little bit like lightning uh, the chinese call it smoke fiction and the term flash tells us what to expect from the form a moment of sudden brief intense illumination revealing something previously unrevealed you think of that term uh, smoke fiction it doesn't last very long as long as it takes uh, to uh, to smoke a cigarette on a work break uh, and flash that something happens very suddenly the element of revelation is crucial and the size range is roughly 200 to a thousand words although there are people who will say that you can write flash uh, from you know six or seven words or, or on and that it can be up to 1500 2000 words or whatever but let's say that the, the, the median range is between 200 and a thousand words and the harder they are to write the shorter really uh, they get a little bit easier as you bring them up to the eight nine hundred thousand words it's very hard to fit in an entire story in 200 words but certainly worth a try if you can do it uh, uh, how do i explain it to myself when i'm in class to my students as well uh, it's that uh, one evening walking home from the village uh, shannon vale uh, to another village in west cork clonakilty uh, on a dark rural road with a friend of mine a moonless dark rural road road uh, we were walking along chatting 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 nice and ni nice and comfortably enjoying our stroll in the dark uh, and uh, suddenly there was a flash of lightning uh, and within about three feet of us there was a bull with its horns kind of pointed threateningly in our direction then we would have walked right into uh, those horns only for the flash of lightning uh, so that sudden brief intense revelation for me at the center of, uh, of flash fiction uh, look uh, new scrolls for new scrollers you look up on the uh, in one corner of the screen there you can see uh, the uh, way that people used to read long long ago unfurling long long scrolls and now we scroll down uh, on, our, on our smartphones when we write flash we're aiming to catch people's attention for a brief intense period you might add here so is everyone else in the world who produces any kind of media uh, so we're not only competing with other literary forms but also with all other media content flash means very little scrolling i don't know about you but i think that the ebook as a long form doesn't really work too well or long form fiction long form journalism doesn't really work too well for most people uh, on, on online because they tend to scroll to to click out of longer things without scrolling too much but you keep yours uh, with just a couple of uh, finger scrolls for your flash fiction or none at all if you could make it so it's read briefly intensely and doesn't hugely uh, demand people's time or attention uh, but does leave a big impression all the same okay no foreplay this is a huge uh, thing in flash and one of the big mistakes that people make is trying to insert an introduction uh, you know in a background and a uh, you know, backstory and all kinds of things in flash of course it doesn't work in flash we don't have time for intros lead ups digressions etc that we do in longer uh, forms and can that can be quite fun and quite essential in longer forms flash fiction should also so always take place at a moment of rupture and critical turn, i.e. it should be all climax. Flashers ancient and new. Of course, there are a lot, a lot, a lot of antecedents of flash fiction. Short fictional forms have been around in one form or another since the beginning of, of, of literary culture. Look at Aesop there. He's in a bad way, uh, obviously, uh, but he, uh, you know, invented, we should say, or, or at least perfected uh, the didactic parable, which I guess is one form of flash lydia davis a modern uh, parabolist uh, a modern flash fiction writer a great writer 
Donald Bark team uh, there you can see I suppose uh, would have reached the kind of zenith of the experimental short or short fiction form Freddie Nisha there down the bottom the aphorism and his little tiny stories often uh, again uh, you know focused on sudden brief moments of illumination uh, we can look at things like the Arabian Nights we can look at things like Boccaccio's the Cameron and many 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 other antecedents we can look at the parables uh, in the Bible uh, for examples of very short brief intense illuminating texts and uh, we can look at things like B uh, Blake's memorable fancies and proverbs of hell as well I've got a long list of those kind of literary texts in the online version or the text version I should say of this uh, uh, talk which is up at the bogmanscanon.com you get a link uh, underneath and I've got a lot more lists of writers but one of the things I want to point out here is if you think that Flash is for people who don't take uh, literature seriously or aren't really very good writers uh, uh, you know and are just trying out something simple then you've got it wrong the two uh, people I've got up top there are among the most important and most serious of contemporary writers Lydia Davis a translator of Proust uh, and you don't get more serious or literary than that and Donald Bark team uh, in the 70s the you know most influential uh, short fiction writer in the US and you know and, and in a lot of the English speaking world uh, everybody got Carveritis uh, in the 80s and 90s so he slipped into the background but Bark team is someone who I really really recommend that you check out as a short short fiction or you know he wouldn't have probably even known the term uh, but he has a lot to say to it all the same in his work I think okay now one thing I do a lot in my writing practice is I parody, I parody and I imit text imit texting uh, means basically uh, you know writing fake versions of non literary text so fake CVs and job descriptions fake news briefs fake suicide notes and funeral relations uh, uh, fake stand-up comedy anecdotes, fake encyclopedia entries, and so on and so forth. You to, there's endless non-literary text which you can use, and again, I have a longer list of those on the text version, but you have enough to be going on with there. Write a fake, a fake CD, a crazy CV, a job description for the craziest job you can think of, news briefs about your local village, which are, you know, absolutely outlandish, suicide notes for, for, for everyone you hate, or funeral orations for everybody you love. Do's and don'ts of flash fiction. Okay, don't just give a synopsis of a novel or a short story. That's the worst mistake people generally make with flash fiction. Uh, just it, it, it's really just what you'd read on the back of a, of, of a long of, of a longer text on the back of the cover of a longer text. Uh, that's a waste of time. So it's not about shrinking or condensing in that way at all. It's not about making something bigger as small as you can to fit it into a, a box. It's about writing something which fits uh, the form of flash itself without any uh, resizing being done to it. Uh, be precise and prudent okay precision is very important in all sorts of writing and prudence also but in flash they really come into their own because you know precision and prudence will shorten uh, our text and condense and make it more dense and suggestive use broad strokes and suggestiveness along with nuggets of precision so if you're setting scenes set them in a broad stroke way okay and then focus in on the important uh, event of your flash fiction and describe that as precisely as you can against a broad stroke background okay cliche proof your writing everyone's writing suffers from cliche because of uh, the culture uh, we inhabit is soaked with cliche so we can't avoid writing cliches on our first draft really but we do need to go back and cliche proof our writing and we avoid cliche by seeing with our own eyes and speaking with our own words okay now content is is king. Uh, don't write any kind of writing, especially flash fiction that is really repeating uh, what's being put into uh, fiction a million times before. Every flash fiction should have sentences and events in it which have never been described before. So they must really come from your own unique imagination or from your own unique experience, okay? Uh, or from what you gather from others' unique experience or imagination, by the way, as well, okay? Do write and rewrite and try to shrink the story down to its barest uh, elements. Cut out everything which is, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, unnecessary. And do trust your reader because, uh, you know, the imagination of the literary reader is well trained and can fill in the gaps. So you don't have to tell the literary reader everything. Again, use those broad uh, strokes, which I talked about earlier on uh, to set up very broad strokes will do fine. Uh, build up a scrapbook. This is a, a kind of a background, uh, background advice. Build up a scrapbook of thoughts, anecdotes, dreams, eavesdrops, small local stories, any kind of brief text which might have a bigger meaning or connection. Eavesdrops. You might look at that one and say, oh God, we can't do that. Well, every writer should eavesdrop, of course. Uh, I was walking down a street in Dublin, which is known for its um, colour uh, on the one hand and for its kind of misery on the other. It's a drug dealing street. It's an open air drug supermarket, really. I won't embarrass the, the locals by naming it. But anyway, uh, I walked uh, past three addicts who were arguing with each other. Uh, the small guy was arguing with a tall guy and the tall guy's girlfriend. Uh, of course, they only argue about you know one or two things: money, money, and drugs. And the uh, the small guy who was the one under pressure, uh, as I was passing, said, uh, "I swear on my little baby's grave." Uh, so I mean, that really is enough, isn't it, uh, for a flash fiction? I wouldn't put too much around something like that. So sometimes you can be lucky and you get an entire uh, text uh, out of just listening. Okay, but basically, scrapbooking is important or notebooking, and there's no shortage of apps to help you to do that. You don't have to carry a notebook around with you as long as you have a smartphone these days. Okay, be yourself again. I'm going to say it. I keep saying it. I'll say it again and again. Draw on personal experiences, perspectives, motivations. Be as different as you can. Now, this is not the same advice as write what you know, because that's often taken to limit in a limited way as simply the things that kind of physically happened to you over the course of your existence in the real world. But of course, there's much more to us than what, what, what happens to us in the real world. There's also our perspectives on it, our motivations, our desires, our dreams, our imaginations. So you, when you count all those things, you, you, you know quite a lot of things and your knowledge is effectively uh, infinite when we include the imagination in that. So you know, you're know you your own resource uh, and your uniqueness uh, in terms of perspective and experience and imagination really is your, if you like, your selling point in the flash fiction world as it is in any artistic world. Okay, some flashcards, prompts for you to try. Let's go through them. Write a brief oration for someone you who you wish were dead. Uh, we've all got a few of those, I'm sure. Uh, let it out, okay? Don't name them. Don't get yourself in trouble, uh, but let let it out. Uh, we got to let our anger and our vengeance go sometimes in literature. Sometimes it can really work and produce great texts, okay? Write a spoof etymology. That is history of a place name uh, for the Irish place name of your choice. There's Skull. I often think of it as, 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 as twinned with... Um, Crossbones in Alabama. There's Comer's Graveyard. Uh, make what you like of that up there in County Galway. There's Gagging again down in West Cork. Kinsale, where you go to sell your family. The choice is endless. Uh, or, or any other country. There's great place names everywhere, of course. But Ireland has a particularly uh, good list of funny ones to uh, make up stuff about. Uh, write a recipe for disaster. Again, throw in the people, places, and things which, when they were brought together in front of you, or if they were brought together in front of you, would mean a total disaster in your life. You are in a restaurant and have eaten a terrible meal, had a bad day in the office and drank six espressos, write a ragingly insane note to the chef. And again, kind of going off on one of those temporary madnesses that are, that are overcome us uh, in situations like that. They're good things to write flash about, uh, those temporary madnesses. That's one of them. Okay. Write a suicide note for a dog or a cat detailing the last straw event which caused this decision. Now, I've had students over the years who've had a really, really, really good time with this one. So uh, yeah, I think this is a good one to try. Uh, next, write a description of a lost Renaissance parent painting. Lost Renaissance parent. Lost Renaissance painting you have found in your aunt's attic. Now, that's a fake art history exercise. So, again, we're faking it and we're making stuff up and we're grafting onto reality our, our, our imagination. A real, uh, you know, a, a very fruitful way to go about uh, becoming an artist or a writer. You're a spy from another universe listening into a fragmented, interrupted telephone conversation between a Hezbollah operative and the head of the CIA. Scream scripted. You are a burglar and you break into a mansion in Kalini. When you switch on the light, you see something completely unexpected. What is it? I will put a link underneath to bogmanscanon.com where you'll find flash, uh, more flash prompts and more detailed writings about flash fiction and how I teach it and how I approach it. 
slash antecedents and all that kind of thing, uh, which if you want to have a go off the form, it's a good idea to check it out. Uh, look, uh, now, the, my own first book of frags, which you'll find up on the internet, you can buy it or download it for free, I don't really care, uh, it's up to yourself, but I think there's some good examples of Flash in that, and I do teach uh, often enough uh, in the big smoke writing factory and maybe in Bray, Bray as well, and around the place at festivals and things like that, Flash Fiction workshops, so I'm, I'm available those if anybody wants kind of a real live one, uh, but I hope you enjoyed this little uh, tutorial that I put together. I'm on Facebook as Dave Lorden. And look, if you have any question, uh, friend me there and uh, ask the question. I, I, I usually have time to give a brief answer. So thanks for thanks for uh, listening to this uh, tutorial. Mighty stuff. Cheers. Take it easy.